702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Chris, good morning to you. Hello, Hello you, CB. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you very much. And you? I'm otherwise very well and excited by the science story. Just in time for summer that's looming here in South Africa. Mosquitoes. Well, I saw this and thought of you, pretty much, actually. Because, um, as you say, it's going into summertime and it's going into the time when mosquitoes get hungry, female mosquitoes yes. specifically. And, of course, mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal on Earth. We all think it's snakes and spiders and other venomous things. Mosquitoes kill more people or account for more deaths. And the reason is because they are the vector that spreads infectious diseases like malaria. There are hundreds of millions of cases of malaria every year. Half a million kids die of malaria every year. So this is really serious. Um, people in the past have tried to tackle this by poisoning mosquitoes and the problem with that is that the poisons are not very specific. They take down the mosquitoes but then they damage the environment and they can damage people as well. So is there a better way? Well researchers at Imperial College in London, this is Andrea Crisanti and his colleagues, they've published a paper this week announcing a technique that they dub a gene drive. The way this works is that you make a genetic alteration to a mosquito and or a group of mosquitoes, you release them into the wild and when they mate with the wild population, they pass this genetic change on and the genetic change then modifies the population in such a way that they become infertile. What they've targeted is a gene called DBX or double sex and the interesting thing about this gene is that one form of it is switched on in female mosquitoes and makes them develop as females. A different form is switched on in males and makes them develop as males. The group at Imperial have targeted just the female form. So what this means is that when this gene goes into the population, the males can pass it on and they're healthy, they're capable of mating with females and passing on the, the trait, but the females then don't develop properly, so they're infertile. Mm. So over a number of generations, this causes the population to crash. And in laboratory experiments, it took about 8 to 12 generations, in other words, reproductive cycles, for the population to become completely inviable and stop reproducing. So their idea would be that you would make a group of these genetically modified mosquitoes that have the ability to pass on this abnormal form of DBX. You then release those into your area where slowly the uh, mosquitoes will mate with the wild population endow them as carriers of this trait which will slowly remove fertile females from the population and you have two wins because if you remove fertile females they're the ones that do the biting and spread the diseases they're also the ones that are going to lay the eggs and cause more mosquitoes so either way it's a win-win it's not without considerable thought going into this because if we do this we are seeking to eradicate a species of animal from earth there may be consequences and we need to think very carefully before we do that. But at the moment, we are in the grip of malaria. It's not going away and we're doing worse things for the environment to try to control it at the moment. So uh, genetic techniques like this do look promising, but they're going to need careful thought before we do them. Martin, good morning. Welcome to the show. What is your question for Chris? Okay, uh, I'm Martin from Woodstock. Um, Chris, if you have two identical twins who are possibly the father of a child, seeing as they've got identical DNA, can a paternity test tell which one was the real father? <laughs> the answer, put simply, is no. And the reason it's no is because if you've got genetically identical twins, the way they form during development is that an egg is fertilised by a single sperm, so a single egg with its genetic complement is fertilised by a single sperm with its genetic complement, making a fertilised zygote, fertilised egg, which has got a genetic makeup. And at some point during the development, very early usually, this divides into two embryos. And those two embryos therefore carry the identical genetic complement to each other, and you cannot tell them apart genetically. Mm. So if you had a paternity test done on a child and you had one of a pair of twins who was the potential father, then you couldn't tell on that basis which of the two was the father of that child unless unless there was something that had happened downstream of those, those individuals developing to introduce a, a, a characteristic genetic change that you could pick up in those, those twins. Now, mu new mutations do happen and can happen, but on the basis of how we normally do these sorts of paternity tests, it would be very, very difficult to tell apart those fathers. But, but there are ways that if they have, by chance, introduced a genetic change that you could pick up in one of them but not the other, then you might be able to do it that way. But no, it would be really tricky. 
Sorry, Martin, that your twin get you into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that one. <laughs> Ian, good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Uh, good morning. Why is it that hurricanes and typhoons, the serious ones, seem to occur mainly in the, in the Northern Hemisphere? It's a lovely question. Is it factually true that, um, firstly, Chris, and if so, what accounts for that? Well, first of all, um, the, what, what are these storms? Well, they're enormous uh, unleashings of power, um, and they are driven by warm sea temperatures, which warm the air, and as a result of warm air, you get air movement, and if you get air movement that's sufficiently fast, you get a big storm. When a big storm is a problem is when it impacts not the environment, because there's no one there to see it, but people. Where do all the people live? The vast majority of the world's population, about 75%, are living or more, are living in the northern hemisphere. So we are more likely to see reports and to hear consequences and catastrophes being reported because these things have impacted on people in the northern hemisphere, which is why we see that happening. Mm. There are far fewer yep. people and less landmass yep. in the southern hemisphere, so we don't encounter these mm. things. But actually the physics works the same way, north or south, and we do see storms in the north and the south. We just don't see them impacting people in the same way in the southern hemisphere so much. So I think it's probably a reporting bias rather than any kind of meteorological bias. Lance, good morning. Welcome to the show. Yes, good morning, you see, yes. So this is a very weird question. Um, like I've noticed, I live in Cape Town, and when I go to the city, especially by the train station, you see all the pigeons. They don't have legs and feet and whatever. But then you go to a place like Simonstown or Musenberg, and the pigeons are extremely healthy in that. What makes these birds live in different areas and choose a different lifestyle? I think the same goes for humans, doesn't it? I mean, maybe there are some, also some hungry people around and some some dodgy restaurants. So I wouldn't I wouldn't go in a fast food restaurant down yep. there. Um, it's interesting. I was talking to someone about pigeons the other day, uh, a guy who works in the States and has actually done some genetics on pigeons. And he told me that um, pigeons were first domesticated from wild birds about 5,000 years ago. And people began to selectively breed them. And he's worked out the genes that cause pigeons to have their plumage patterns. But what's really interesting is that the gene that makes a certain type of plumage has sitting right next to it a region of the DNA that controls how good you are at putting on body weight. And it just turns out that because pigeons naturally would have lived in pretty nasty, wild in desert and wild environments, they actually had a genetic makeup that made them very good at picking up calories and storing energy. But when those pigeons end up in cities, they don't need to store energy because there's food and rubbish on tap to eat all the time. So th th and th for this reason, they've shed that ability when they're an urban dwelling pigeon. And you find that the ones that are very good at storing energy tend to bloat out, get too fat and are not very healthy in cities, a bit like humans. And so they tend to not be found so often in cities. But the, um, the ones that are less good at storing energy are found more often in cities. The ones that are good at storing energy are found uh, more often in, in wild places. So the environment selects for the uh, genetic makeup of the pigeon that lives there and also the environment is pretty harsh in cities there are going to be predators like foxes and cats knocking around there's also going to be more competition between birds for the food that that is available whereas if they're out in the wild um, they might face different challenges and they might be differently adapted to coping with them so i think it's probably a range of factors 702 and cape talk the naked scientist leon good morning to you what is your question Good morning to you. Good morning to you. Hello, Chris. Uh, the question basically revolves around DNA and blood transfusions. What I'd like to find out is if somebody is, say, say for example, a rhesus positive, and they have a blood transfusion from somebody who is obviously going to be probably O, does this, in fact, alter the person who's receiving the blood transfusion? Does this have any effect on his DNA? Hello, Leon. Nice question. Uh, the answer is, in a nutshell, no, because the red blood cells that form most of the uh, blood that is given do not have a nucleus, at least in humans. In birds, the red blood cells are nucleated, and that's how in some uh, crime stories you'll see that people who've tried to pass off bird blood as human blood for various tests or uh, to contaminate crime scenes get caught because the red blood cells of birds do have a nucleus in them, but our red blood cells get rid of theirs when they're developing in our bone marrow. Uh, they do it probably to mean that the cells can get smaller, and that means they're much more efficient at slipping through our blood vessels. And because they get rid of their nucleus, they've got rid of their DNA, and so as a result, the red blood cells 
don't have DNA in them. We also leukodeplete. We remove the white blood cells from the vast majority of blood transfusions, and this is done for a range of reasons in a range of countries. Not all countries, but the vast majority of people will leukodeplete blood. If, if you have a blood transfusion from a living donor, obviously that's not done because you take blood straight out of one person and put it into another, who's compatible, obviously. But um, often these stored blood transfusions are leukodepleted, meaning removal of white blood cells. They're the ones with nuclei. They're the ones with DNA in them. So the amount of DNA in there is going to be absolutely tiny uh, compared to the amount of host person recipient DNA that's knocking around. So you're not going to change that person's DNA profile uh, to any great degree by doing a blood transfusion. Obviously, you also made reference to things like the group of the blood and whether they're rhesus positive or not. When giving a blood transfusion, those refer to markers or chemical signatures on the surfaces of the cells that are being transfused it's very important to match those up because otherwise you could have an incompatible blood transfusion and that could be life-threatening so it's very important we get that right but that's not related to a person's dna in the blood transfusion it's related to their genetic makeup per se and we can do simple tests in a tube to look for those chemicals before we give the blood so we know what blood to give to which recipient I think we've got a question via the WhatsApp voice note. Let's see whether it's clear enough. What would you say about the notion that the Y chromosome in men is a mutated or damaged X chromosome? Okay, so what are we referring to when we talk about Y chromosomes? Well, if you look at human cells, you'll see there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. Why we call them pairs is that for 22 of those chromosomes, for instance, let's take chromosome number one, there is two chromosome number ones. And one of those you got from your mother and the other one you got from your father. Same for chromosome two, same for chromosome three, etc. Right out to chromosome number 22. And then after that, the 23rd pair don't always look the same. They can look different and they're referred to as heterosomes or heterochromosomes. Hetero meaning different for that reason. Hmm. Sometimes there can be two X chromosomes, so they do look the same, and that makes a woman, and that's where your dad gives an X chromosome and your mum gives an X chromosome, and so the baby ends up XX and is female. But other times, the dad uh, gives a Y chromosome and the mother always has to give an X because she's XX, and you get an X and a Y, and so you end up with a Y in place and that drives the development of a baby instead of the default development being female it drives it down the lineage of, of developing as a man. So where did this come from in the first place? Well we don't think that these chromosomes necessarily started off identically they must have appeared from somewhere in the past and it's possible that, that there was some kind of mutation of an X chromosome that turned into a Y in the past but the Y chromosome is so tiny now and bears almost no resemblance to the X chromosome that um, we, we don't know exactly what its origins were and when but we know that animals have been using this sort of sexual determination technique going back millions and millions of years so whether the Y chromosome came originally from X and human I don't know, but um, it it's certainly doesn't bear much resemblance to it anymore. The X chromosome is very big. What's left of the Y chromosome, there's not much left of it. It's very tiny in comparison now. Good morning, uh, Chris and Eusebius. Um, I'm, was, uh, I'm very interested in um, fermentable sugars in grain, um, but i come to understand that there's many different types of sugar within the grain, and not all of them are fermentable, and not all, uh, so not all get broken down by the yeasts. Um, I was just wondering, Chris, could maybe extrapolate on the different types of sugar, the different uh, ways they get processed by the body, and possibly the way sugars uh, get processed post-fermentation as opposed to pre-fermentation uh, within the body. Um, this is Andrew from Cape Town. Thanks. Oh, thanks for the question. Well, first of all, what's a seed or what is grain? Well, gra grains and seeds are storage vehicles. When a plant makes seeds, what it's doing is effectively packing a huge amount of energy, a bit like a battery packs a lot of energy into a small space, so that when it germinates, it's got a supply of energy to, fa to, to sort of fuel or power the growth of that plant when it starts to come up in the spring before it has a chance to unfurl its solar panels called leaves and do the process of photosynthesis. Now when we go and we take those grains and we eat them, we're basically stealing the stored energy from the plant and we're using it in our bodies. Now the usual form of plant storage is starch. Starch is a giant molecule which is made by linking lots of glucose molecules together. And the way that we release the glucose from the starch, or the way that nature does this, is that you use enzymes, and one of those enzymes is called amylase, 
because another word for starch is amylose and an enzyme that breaks something down, you, you change the end to ASE. So amylase breaks down amylose. And it does this by prizing off y- units of glucose sugar away from the core polymer of the starch. Now, it doesn't do it always in single units. They have enzymes that will break off chunks of the starch and they do it into not necessarily individual glucose units but longer chains of sugars and they then break those into even shorter chains so you end up with maltoses and maltodextroses and so on and so the enzymes that do this sometimes they chop in just one place sometimes they'll make longer chains you get a range of sort of sugars being released from the starch when these things break them down same happens in our body but the 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 common energy currency that we're going for is usually glucoses but most of the time you can access most of those sugars in in a grain the ones you can't access very well are the cellulose polymers cellulose is another polymer of glucose lots of glucose molecules stuck together but they're stuck together in a different way that means they're much harder to break down in your body so we call that soluble fiber and when you eat that uh, you can't break it down with your digestion but the bacteria that live in your guts they can break that down a bit and as a result uh, it keeps your bowel healthy so uh, i hope that sort of answers the question it's a a slightly difficult one to answer Hmm. yasin we only have 90 seconds left get straight to the question Uh Yes, quickly. I know Big Pharma has got a problem with trying to hide this in a way, but uh, does bariatric surgery, uh, does it assist in, in, in getting rid of diabetes from somebody? Yes, it can. Bariatric surgery is where we encourage or we, we make it uh, very difficult for people to eat or the same amount that they're accustomed to eating or to overeat. And you do that by reducing the volume of the stomach. There are other ways of also helping people to lose weight by bypassing segments of the small intestine, which is where most of the calorie absorption occurs. Type 2 diabetes is the diabetes form associated with carrying too much weight. It's where your body becomes resistant to your own insulin. If you undergo a process that leads to you losing weight, then you can resensitize your body to your insulin. And this can, in some cases, mean a person ceases to be diabetic anymore, or in other cases, their diabetes improves enormously. So the bottom line is, yes, if you can lose weight, this is very good for diabetic control. And so bariatric surgery as a means of weight loss can therefore help you to become better uh, controlling your diabetes. Stunning. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for accommodating us. Uh, Chat to you again next week. All right. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye.